Oh, hello there, and welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your friend, Agassino Zinger, and this is episode number 383, that's 383 of the Agassino Zinger Show. What's going on? How are you doing? Great, amazing, awesome, good. How am I? You know, same old, hanging on in there by the skin of my teeth. If it's your first time checking the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, make sure you download the show, give me a five-star review, and share it with your friends. And if you want to support the show via Patreon, the link is down below in the comments pinned. You can support the show for as one dollar, $1 per month. If you support the show via Patreon, you get access to my entire audio library as well as this show, like sometimes five, four days ahead of everybody else in full audio format, only available via Patreon. So make sure you sign on there at patreon.com for just Agostino, patreon.com for just A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. Make sure you sign on there. Don't delay. And of course, if you're watching via YouTube, make sure you smash that like, right? Like don't cost you anything. Smash the like. Make sure you let in the algorithm know that you're enjoying the show and all that good stuff. But yeah, man, here we are. We're back again. Back again. Another episode. Another dreary week of um, COVID-inspired cultural commentary from me, Agostino. Of course, I'm not going to give you that. I'm not going to be that harsh. You know what I mean? There's other bad stuff going on and, you know, that sort of nonsense. But yeah, how's my weekend? Non-existent, really, as per usual. Um, it's still of October, so that's been nice. Going to the gym, hanging out at home, training a bit here and there doing the bit of running which i'm going to be starting what this week that should be great had a bit of a back pull actually unfortunately over the weekend so that's my major incident i pulled my back doing deadlifts rounding my back too much not flattening it where it should be not wearing a belt and um, all that good stuff you know uh, in all honesty belts are meant to help you correct your positioning but you should have good positioning or good posture prior to putting a belt on but belts helps you keep like you know good habits good practices and i didn't do that Again, and I did this dumb thing too. Usually when you're doing deadlifts or anything of that ilk, you usually warm up. But I went straight into doing my one rep max. <laughs> Don't ask why. And of course, pulled my back. But luckily I was able, I pulled it not so, not as much as I did last time. Where I really sunk into it and sort of tore some tendons. This time around, I sort of just tweaked it. A bit of a sprain. Nothing too harsh. So, you know, took a bit of ibuprofen, which, you know, isn't the best for you. But again, it was, it, it did this, it is job in terms of reducing the inflammation and then, you know, some mobility exercises here and there, a bit of ice, blah, 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 blah. And now I'm back to fighting. Um, yeah, I'm back to fighting fit. That's basically where I've been at the moment, but that's been a bit, but I'm feeling good though. I feel like I'm getting stronger. Biceps are getting a little bit bigger, right? Um, I think tiny bit, but Hey, we're getting there little by little. And, um, yeah, that's, that's been the one joy I've had in my life, man. The one joy. Please don't take that away from me, um, you damn government, right? That's what you don't want, right? They, they decide to lock things down again and they take away the one thing that's bringing me joy, going to a gym. If that wasn't around, I honestly don't know what I'd be doing. I really don't. <clears throat> it will be a struggle. It really would be a struggle. But hey, we are here, praised be to the most high. So, plenty of topics to get into let's not waste any more time let's get right on into it topic number one um this really cool article i recommend you read on the washington post called america's americans might never go come back to work what am I, what's wrong with me am i literally reading out loud americans might never come back to the office and twitter is leading the charge um this is uh, twitter's plans to work from home and definitely have promoted have prompted a wave of copycats <laughs> British transformation has been two years in the making and the rest of America can learn some lessons so it's a really cool article basically detailing the complete change the complete 360 in corporate um in the corporate world or just office work in general where essentially because of COVID everyone's having to work remotely and this is essentially rewriting the entire rules about working from home for most companies reworking directions that some companies are taking in terms of how they use the offices where their offices are located it's it's just a complete eye opener and um it's really been interesting for myself you know i've been in the workforce for the majority of my adult life um towards the latter part of it obviously i had made the shift to the office life which has been great don't get me wrong but there is something i do miss about earning a um, honest days living working in the service industry some of the best people I'm, i met were working in retail um you know working in various other places and so you know bars whatever it may be restaurants for a little bit here and there some volunteering you know not volunteering some um what they call it some temp work that i did doing 
that sort of catering stuff where you dress up in like a you know bow tie and you're going around with canapes and shit those have been some of my best jobs you meet some of the best people some real lifelong quote-unquote friends people that you keep in touch with you grow up a lot you just see another another side of the life in it. and as soon as you move into the office world it gets a little bit entitled people are a little bit up their own ass they think their shit don't stink and generally people try and you know busy themselves that's what you see a lot in office work um a lot of busy a lot of busy bots a lot of people walking around with laptops under their arms booking meeting rooms to have 10 minute chats make it look like they're doing something a lot of you know nonsensical kpi it's just nonsense in it and all most of it is in the guys are just you know putting this facade up that you're doing something and unfortunately if you're the person that actually owns a company you're the person that actually founds a company you're the person that's the chief executive officer whose livelihood is dependent on the success of the company it's not beneficial to you right it really isn't um if you have a workforce that is essentially phoning it in so if anything from what i've seen in my own experience i've seen usually the people that are allowed to work from home or are given special dispensation to sort of like work remotely because of you know having young kids or because they live far are usually the best performers because they recognize the favor they recognize the um the sort of uh you know the benefit of doubt i don't know yeah maybe the favors a bit good they recognize the favor that they're being given by the company and they don't want to take the piss out of that so they go out their way to perform and of course the other added benefit is because you're working from home you don't have the um disadvantage of having somebody come over to your desk every two to five minutes you know having a chit chat and just generally dis distracting you from your work which then of course you know lowers your uh, ability to perform to the highest level which then of course is going to affect the bottom uh, the bottom dollar of the company or the bottom line of the company you're working for so this shift towards remote working as beneficial as it is to you know boosting people's mental health and allowing um employees to you know pursue their passions outside of work and all that malarkey for the most part this article does specify that it mostly is a net positive for the companies because they get motivated employees who are unlikely to leave and who are going to perform at the highest level possible because they know they've been given a special they've been given a blessing from god let's say quote unquote especially if you work for a company like a pepsico right a shell um one of these really stuffy companies that you know for them working remotely is like a sin right i remember i worked for a big corporation once i'm not going to name them but you know working remotely required you having to you know um turn on a particular vpn have your webcam on like some mad nonsense and looking back on it was really really intrusive but you know they have these really weird hang-ups when it comes to working outside the office because the office is seen as like as a mark of i don't know success a mark of um or maybe it's a, it seems like a, a a best place to basically observe your employees to you know um to to keep an eye on the inner office dynamics there was obviously opportunity as well if you're in the office too there was a great opportunity for you to um show off and sort of like you know show out for your managers because you know you stay you come in early they see you you leave late they see you um you know you're burning midnight oh it's all kind of a weird game so that obviously eliminates it but i think for companies anyway like i said i think it's best for them because their retention is better especially now with covid and everyone offering remote working if your high performers can get offers to work other places remotely they're going to leave so most companies don't want to let go of their best people because hiring is annoying trust me i've done interviews before um i've sat on the other side of an interview table it's it's a horrendous experience to go through to to vet through people to make sure they're the right fit culturally to make sure that they're the right fit in just terms of doing the job it's just really difficult so if you've got someone that's already doing um performing at a high level why let them go so this whole remote working thing is if anything really serving the offices or the companies the most but this article really details it in a really good way obviously it's interesting to see that twitter was the one that sort of spearheaded it i think they mentioned here in 2018 jack dorsey sent like a random um email to the entire company that was meant for only a few people but he decided to send it out to everybody instead and that sort of you know sparked the necessary change in terms of getting things um to become remote and you'd think looking at jack dorsey the fact that he meditates and the fact that he goes to on retreats silent retreats and stuff you would think that twitter would would have already been looking at remote working anyway prior but 
even them, like a company that I would think would be a little bit more woo-woo, um, had only thought about working from home since in 2018. Of course, sometime before the COVID, but you would have just thought, considering Jack's temperament, that they would have done it. Because I know WordPress have already introduced something like that. Because, you know, again, their founder is someone that likes to um, work remotely, work away from the office. Um, you know, there's a complete, there's a whole different, there's a whole little ecosystem, a little subculture when it comes to remote working and stuff that exists in Silicon Valley. So that was a surprise in that regard. But it's a really detailed article from Washington Post. I really recommend check it out um really really interesting to see where the future of the workplace is going um but yeah let's move on ba, 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 dee, ba, ba, ba. we've got this really disturbing video again which is uh, disturbing news here from fox news and this maybe is a further illustration as to why i was so conflicted when i saw the whole chrissy teigen you know um news spread about her unfortunate situation that they went through as a family with your legend and whatever and the reason why it made me feel conflicted because I've heard, especially from, you know, from reading books and just generally from listening to others who have gone through really tragic consequent tragic scenarios, that grief is really one of those things like similar to love. Um, that's really unexplainable what people will do when they're in that position, when they're in love or when they're going through grief. That sometimes it really is disingenuous, no, I was say disingenuous. Um, you really can never understand unless you're going through it yourself. So I can sometimes excuse sometimes um, admittedly weird and off key behavior, such as what, you know, of course, such as the photo shoot that Chrissy Teigen and John Legend did when they announced the unfortunate, the unfortunate passing of their son. Um, I can excuse some of that because I can I can't ever, you know, put myself in the shoes of somebody that goes through that level of grief right and what that actually makes you do right sometimes your cry for helps can be done in weird really weird really weird weird ways and i think this is a further example of it this is a article from fox news that says the title it says the following parkland parents create artificial intelligence video of slain son to spur voters yeah you hear that right so for some reason i'm not sure sure why they thought this was make sense but you know one of the uh, some parents of the Parkland victim who was, I guess, well known in the school as well for his stance um, against uh, gun violence, decided that they would film a video um, with an actually artificial uh, intelligence video of their slum that passed away. And it's really disturbing. It really, really is. I can't even gather my words together, but it really, really, really is odd. So the following here it says, um, um, wearing his signature hoodie and beanie and earbud casually hanging from his ear, passionate Parkland teen Joaquin Oliver urges his peers to vote for lawmakers that will end gun violence in a new video release on Friday. Next month's election would have been his first chance to vote. The 17-year-old's mannerisms and vernacular, yo, it's me, are shockingly lifelike. And it's just a mirage, a realistic, almost eerie artificial intelligence recreation of the teen who was among the 17 killed in 2018 Valentine's Day massacre at the Majory Stone Hill um, High School in Florida, the worst school shooting in history. From the grave, the teen who is now begging his peers to cast a vote that one he would never cast. And yeah, this is the video itself. I'll play a little bit for you here, but it's really, really, really eerie. Um, and again, just maybe is a further indication of grief, but also of what grief can do to people but also a just so fitting with the year in it considering what we're going what's happening in 2020 trump catching the covid it's this video suddenly popping up out of the woodworks like 2020 can't get more weirder in it? it really cannot but yeah this is the video i am patricia oliver and this is my husband manuel two years ago our beautiful son joaquin was shot and killed at parkland Every day I think about him and what his last moments must have been like. Meanwhile, every day, nearly 100 more Jesus. families lose someone they love to gun violence. Every single day, we keep telling people it doesn't have to be like this. They don't listen. So we found a way to bring back someone that no one will ignore. It's very hard for me to look at this, so please, Please listen to what our son has to say. This is so weird, man. This is so bizarre. 
they've essentially taken the same technology from pawns that they do nowadays and basically use that to resurrect their son it's like god damn it man yo it's me it's guac i've been gone for two years and nothing's changed bro people are still getting killed by guns what is that everyone knows it but they don't do anything i'm tired of waiting for someone to fix it the election in November is the first one I could have voted in. But I'll never get to choose the kind of world I wanted to live in. So you've got to replace my vote. Jesus. Go to unfinishedvotes.com, register, then go vote. Vote for politicians who care more about people's lives than the gun lobby's money. Vote for people not getting shot, bro. I mean, vote for me because I can't. We've got to keep on fighting, and we got to end this. So yeah, man, like, it, like, uh, what's that? They helped craft uh, every detail of the video from their son's wardrobe to his mannerisms and what he, he would say, relying on his Twitter account and other musings to help guide them. It's something that where you just put the dots together. If you see his post, the way he thinks, he was always still thinking the way he was expressing his frustration at the situation his mom said in a phone interview on friday the teen affectionately known as guac was affected by racism at a young age and a, and protective of his hispanic immigrant parents when he was 12 years old he wrote letters of gun makers asking why they didn't support universal background checks we are letting joaquin grow into his ideas and how he will be um, reacting to things that are happening today his father said we know our son is so well um, and we know exactly what he wanted that he, he wanted from life. The lifelike image is also painful to watch from the grieving parents. She said, I couldn't even breathe well, his mother said in the first interview she saw the video. She said, um, of course, we know that it's not Joaquin, but they did such an amazing job with the technology that I, you can say, oh, my God, how I wish that could be a real Joaquin. They're talking to everybody. For Manuel Oliver, he's harnessed the pain to create the change. The artist has traveled to the country on Joaquin's behalf, painting a mural of his son's birthday. Um, outside the National Rifle Association's headquarters and leading a rally at the headquarters of the Smith & Wesson. I cannot describe this painful, but it's powerful. Yeah, and again, man, what a bizarre world, isn't it, that we're living in right now, where this is, this is why sometimes it's difficult to kind of have a critical opinion of these things, because you can understand the pain of the parents. You can understand them wanting, not them not wanting other parents to go through whatever grief they're going through at the moment. Um, you can understand them being, you know, feeling quite, um, you know, uh, feeling like they can't do anything, right? Feeling like their hands are tied and in trying whatever they can to make their message heard. But God, this is weird, isn't it? If, if it wasn't weird enough, you know, to get, you know, half of the Hollywood telling you to vote and telling you how important it was to get out there and put your vote in, how much more, you know, seeing a kid that passed away in a school shooting telling you imploring you to go and vote to make your voice heard because they can't do so god damn it man it comes from a good place but there's a part of me just thinks like you know maybe it wasn't the best way to go about doing things but again maybe i'm off the mark there let me know in the comments down below continuing on continuing on interesting news here from the uk regarding the cinemas and something that has been really intriguing me over this you know of course during during covid um we've seen loads of different business sectors being affected um in really interesting and sometimes brutal ways and one of them that's really been spiking my interest has been the effects on the cinema industry the effects on movies um, we've sort of always known or got the impression that big studios were very resistant or very hesitant to kind of enter into the streaming world, right? To kind of embrace video on demand. Um, you know, the introduction of Netflix kind of really ruffled some feathers. It kind of really um, put things into question as to the value. It kind of eff effectively devalued the cinema experience, especially for the general consumer who's probably not that bothered about seeing their movie on their laptop or seeing it in the screen. And essentially had to essentially force the cinema industry to have to innovate or maybe offer the customer more because, you know, of what's available out there via vis-a-vis -vis streaming. But it seems like, especially with this headline here, the cinema world is going to cut 45,000 jobs because of COVID, that the cinema world is just refusing 
They're refusing to accept the future. They're refusing to accept the realities they're living in. They got, they're trying to, you know, the 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 movie goers and industry at large is trying to pull them into the 21st century, kicking and screaming, but they're just resisting. They just do not want anything to do with it. And it's very, very peculiar to see. So let's read the following article. It says as follows. Shares in Sydney World have plunged after it confirmed it will temporarily close all its cinemas in the UK and the US as it struggles with the pandemic-induced lack of new films to draw in audiences, including the twice-delayed new James Bond instalment. 45,000 employees will be out of work because of the closures, including about 5,500 5, staff in the UK and 20,000 staff in the US, as well as contractors such as cleaners, security workers. Staff were informed of this on Sunday. The world's second uh, biggest cinema operator said it's 127 Cine Worlds and Picture House cinemas and it's 300, 536 Regal cinemas in the US world would shut from Thursday. Cine World share price plunged um, at the start of trading on Monday by as much as 60% to a record low of 15.6 pence per share. That was below the levels reached during the UK and US lockdowns in March. God almighty. The sell-off eased um, slightly after the initial trading was shared down to 20, 27% at 29p. The cinema industry has been caught between coronavirus pandemic safety measures in some of the world's uh, biggest markets, which have limited in audience numbers and a delay in key films that are being kept um, to tempt sorry, audiences back. The latest film in the Bond franchise, No Time to Die, have been rescheduled to November, but this week was delayed until until July, sorry, um, April the second, twenty twenty, a year later than initially planned, the industry was also rattled by the Disney decision to release its live-action Mulan remake straight to a streaming service, bypassing cinemas. Cine uh, World said it was monitoring the situation closely as it waited for the distributors to plan the launch of the blockbuster uh, for, that account for the large proportion of the multiplex sales. So. Cinemas, by and large, from my from what I know, they 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 usually rely on the sale of confectionaries, of course, and of course, you know, big studio movie releases. That's majorly what they rely on. So, if you're wondering why you have to pay six pounds or five dollars for a flipping Snickers bar, it's usually because that's where they make their money on. They don't make their money on ticket sales that much. They usually make most of their income from the confectioners and, of course, from selling loads of tickets for the big uh, movie sales. Because you know, most movies, so most cinemas that you go to, especially if you've got friends that work in cinemas, there's there's hardly more than thirty people in each screening on a random day of the week just watching a movie. But most of their income comes from you know Star Wars. Um, you know some superhero movie coming out and people are seeing it weekend after weekend week after week booking out some of the um, evening uh, screening times and essentially you know making them a bucket load of cash that makes you see them through throughout the month so the interesting thing about this is that Sydney World is effectively reacting to the studios and they're saying that if the studios don't release their movies we can't stay open we can't justify being open because I guess with COVID and even if they do sanitize the rooms and they space people out because they're already losing money during a week by not having the rooms for or the screens for, they're going to lose even more money by having the the screens have to be spaced out in a certain way to allow, you know, for social distancing measures to be, um, uh, to be implemented. But the issue I have with this is that I wonder why they're not, res they're so resistant to innovate or to adapt to the times. Because I would imagine it would be a far better um, idea to essentially have cinemas open, but have them open to serve a particular clientele that would want to see their movies in the cinema. Because as much as I know, I don't really care about seeing movies in the cinema, apart from maybe Avatar and some other big ticket numbers. I know there are moviegoers who exist who would pay to see a movie streamed online for a certain period of time, right? They, really to, they wouldn't even have to release it indefinitely like Netflix. They could have it available for a, for a window, right? For six weeks, 12 weeks, however it may be then take it off the streaming platforms and then re-show it on in the cinemas on its kind of original day of screening and people would still pay for it so you'd get double the income you get the income of somebody watching it one-off um via the streaming websites right you could even just have it just you know not even being a rental thing just like every time you stream it, you have to pay for it that would be a, a pretty easy um option and something that i would gladly pay for and then, of course, you have the option of people buying another ticket when they want to watch the movie in person. I don't necessarily see why they don't do something like that. Um, waiting for life to get back to normal so that you can show your James Bond movie um, to a packed out room. It seems a bit short sighted because there's no there's no guarantee that they're going to survive until they're going to survive, um, you know, until things get back to normal anyway. Right. 
um, and there's no guarantee that things will get back to normal what within the year or within two years so it's it's a very very interesting side of it but again maybe it's a further indication of just how much money these people make when the cinemas are just open as per usual even if they're not even if they're not open even if some of the screens aren't full just the notion of them being open is going to change things but then again part of the issue that i have with this for me personally just looking from the outside which is interesting is that a lot of these industries are struggling and i think that things will just get back to normal once things open there's a lack of i think um acceptance that maybe people's attitudes and behaviors have kind of fundamentally changed forever the same people that would have spent you know their weekends going to the cinema and going to bars and pubs now because you've been restricted in terms of your movement and in terms of your ability to go to said establishments it might just change what you do in a weekend completely forever so for bars and restaurants or for cinemas as well in that regard to think that they can just reopen or they can just hope hold on until stuff reopens and they'll be completely fine i don't necessarily think that's the case I think it'll be a big surprise for some of these establishments to see that once stuff gets reopened, once we have a vaccine, once people are, you know, once we have herd immunity, all this sort of stuff, a lot of people are still going to stay away. They're going to be like, you know what, I'd rather not. So this is a very interesting side of it to get involved in. Again, um, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong in this. Um, let me know in the comments down below There's lo um, and let me know whether or not you would gladly pay two times to see tenant for something or to see the last avengers i would i would stream on my laptop and buy a ticket to watch it in person gladly why not next on the list here we have this really funny news regarding subway sandwiches supposedly they contain too much sugar to be legally considered bread do you know how mad of a story that is especially for someone like myself who spent a good what maybe a year i think might, might have been eight months a few years ago eating nothing but subways this was at a time when i had um a very dodgy connect that allowed me to get these certain you know uh benefits let's say when you walk into subway and i was getting those bad boys every single day i honestly think i might have ate everything on the menu that's on that subway including all the biscuits and shit that are just you know abhorrent right they're not even biscuits then i don't know they're crackers right wherever they are right not not the best of things but i've eaten a lot of shit in subway and um i can I can I can kind of say even before seeing this article that fundamentally that bread was on bread. Number one, when you go in, especially if you go in early in the morning and they just or their own just throughout the day, when they kind of you know uh, putting more bread in the oven, you see how that bread starts and you see how it comes out. It's there's no way that stuff is is legit, especially if you baked at home. You would know how much uh, dough grows when you're you know when you're baking it in the oven, and you also know just how much dough you need to make a loaf or to make a baguette. And sometimes you rock in. I remember when I last went to, but I mean, I haven't been in there in years. Some guy was, you know, kneading the bread, putting it together to put it in the oven. And I, I kid you not, the, the dough itself might have been the size of my pinky. Well, yeah, size of my pinky, sorry. That's the size of the bread that was on the, that was on the, that was on the tray, that was on the baking tray. And suddenly it comes out and it's a foot long, which is kind of the size of my forearm. No way. And then you eat the bread itself and you're like, it's like the, it's even worse than McDonald's. You don't eat McDonald's and you're hungover and then you, you, you sleep and you wake up again and you forgot you even ate, you're still hungry. It's similar to that sort of feeling. It never, ever satiates your hunger at all. Zero. It's not filling in whatsoever way. And if you know anything about eating bread, which I know a little bit about, I'm trying to stay off that now, especially true with, with the training, but you would know that eating a baguette, even, you know, a foot long, would fill you up. If you go, if you went to Tesco's just right now and you picked up a baguette and you just tried to munch down on that the whole entire evening, you'd be full. Now, you wouldn't be full the whole day, but you'd definitely make you full for the next hour or two. Subway doesn't do that at all. If anything, you feel a bit sickly from all the sauce that you put on. And again, that's the another issue about Subway. The bread isn't tasty. The only thing that's tasty about Subway is the actual filling that you put inside it. The meats you use, um, the garnishes you use, there's the the salads that you use that's actual makes it tasty and it's a very 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 delicate balance that you have to kind of you know make in terms of what salad you're using what meats you're using what bread you're using because if you anything kind of goes out of whack essentially your, your your sub has been ruined but yeah to know that the actual bread itself is too sugary to be classified as bread is just absolutely insane so this is from the uh, the journal 
It says the following. It says, Supreme Court today ruled that the sandwiches made by Subway contain too much sugar to be legally considered bread. The ruling today arose from the appeal from the Book Finders Limited, a Subway franchise which claimed that it should not have to pay VAT as many products that it sells as staple foods and should attract a 0% rate. However, the five-judge court ruled that the sandwiches must attract a rate, a VAT rate due to its sugar content. The state, uh, the law states that for bread to be considered a staple product and not attract VAT, it shall not succeed 2% of weight of flour, including the dough. Subway's bread has 10% ratio. This appeal arises from a claim um, submitted by the Revenue Commissioner, by the Book Finders Limited, blah, 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 blah. The court ruled that to exclude um, the bread um, user appellant in their sandwiches from being considered bread under para the this legal terms continue 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 book finders argued that all the ingredients if included would have to be excluded allow the percentage to apply anyway but you you get the gist in it but yeah just imagine that man subway but, but again i don't think depending on what your location is wherever you're watching this i'm sure you can attest subway bread isn't bread you go there major mo, majority for it's sort of like the bread acts like as a vessel for the meats and the sauce and the garnish i think so for the most part um that's what it is it's sort of like a vessel it's sort of like a similar like a taco right i'm not really talking about tacos not really similar because good tacos are good tacos the subway bread just isn't that great i always wonder do do people exist that take their own bread to subway they do they must do that right i'm pretty sure there's some wackos that take their own baguette and say hey can you put my stuffing in there obviously now with covid it probably isn't going to be allowed but i'm sure that's a thing that some people must do um because they want the fillings because the fillings are so tasty they're not even that tasty in themselves and meats i'm pretty sure they're not if i was to put a spoon in there little tuna sweet corn mix i'm pretty sure i would be gagging but yeah funny funny story in that regard and again it's i'm glad to know that because sometimes you know sometimes when you find out that whatever you've sort of taste tested or something that you've kind of seen with your own eyes you can kind of nose off and then suddenly you know it gets proven you know that what you were saying or thinking or tasting was correct this is one of those occasions. <laughs> moving on, moving on, moving on. Oh, guess what? Donald Trump, he got the COVID and this is the way he deals with it, right? My guy got COVID, right? And I guess in a way to kind of show effort and to no, to show force and power and machismo and never say die attitude, he decides to do an entire photo shoot at the Water Reed um, Hospital that he's currently situated in to kind of you know put forth this idea or this impression that he's not suffering and he's strong and America's not going to crumble and all this sort of good stuff. And it's just like, God almighty, peoples are dying on the street. Homelessness is at uh, all-time high unemployment all-time high people's houses are burning right and this guy decides to do an entire photo shoot bronzer included because i think he did a couple of videos where he's looking a bit gray i'm pretty sure he was aware of that and decided to make necessary changes so that he looked nice and tanned just an utterly bizarre individual but and also a perfect encapsulation of 2020 in it like just imagine what it must be like being a fan of Trump as well. How hard it is to kind of, not hard to back him, but like how hard it is to kind of, um, what do you say, rationalize this, explain this, or, you know, there's no way you can explain this really, is it? Because fair enough, you got it. I think, you know, people can get it. Even though he's, he's meant to be in one of the most secure bubbles ever, I think the way that he's going around, you know, the nation, campaigning and stuff, which he's in his right to do, but, you know, he's more likely to get it than most people because he's connecting with or connecting or touching so many people, even though he tries to maintain distance and he says he wears a mask, blah, 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 blah. That necessarily isn't the case. It's just the optics of it. That's really the thing. That's what the mask is really, isn't it? Mask is usually should be classified as an optics thing. It's not even a health and safety thing because I think in the States, you know, there's there's a whole conglomerate of people that just don't believe the virus is as bad as it deal as it, the scientists are making out and they're never going to be convinced otherwise so the only thing that you can sort of rely on the only thing that you can sort of use to kind of fight your to kind of hold your position will be to say hey it's not about you know um adhering to the science guidelines it's just a way of us showing solidarity with each other and saying hey we're all going through the same thing you know how somebody or you know some kid um, unfortunately has leukemia or has some sort of ir um, incurable um, cancer and then you know they you know they have to go through chemotherapy they you know their hair falls out they have to shave their head and in the act of solidarity sometimes their close family or friends will shave their heads in solidarity too because you know especially if you're a young kid shaving your head bald can be a bit of a traumatizing experience so you know in terms of to kind of be there for that person to show solidarity with your friend with your family member you shave your head too 
a mask group should be treated the same sort of way, right? If you, if again, if you're a non-believer in the virus, you should just treat it the same way. Like, hey, we're all going through the same stuff, so I'll just put it on just so I can make everyone around me feel at ease. Less so about you, more so about everyone else around you. But again, in this individual, individualist, individualistic life we live in, with everyone, you know, essentially has their own reality TV show running twenty four seven on their own social media platforms, it's very, um, uh, it's very naive to expect people to somehow um, adhere to some sort of civic responsibility and think about their neighbour in terms of when whether or not should wear a mask. It's just not going to happen. And this is a further indicative of it, isn't it? Because um, he just thinks, you know what, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. But then the interesting development on it is that he decided to film a video too, off the back of it, right? Detailing his experience and saying, hey, this ain't a big deal. I'm okay. I'll be fine. And let's watch a bit of him talking now. We're getting great reports from the doctors. This is an incredible hospital, Walter Reed. The work they do is just absolutely amazing. And I want to thank them all the nurses, the doctors, everybody here. I've also gotten to meet some of the soldiers and the first responders and what a group. I also think we're going to pay a little surprise to some of the great patriots that we have out on the street. And they've been out there for a long time and they've got Trump flags. And Does it mean all these voice sound a bit? You know, and you're holding on a cough. So he's got COVID. He's meant to be quarantining for what, two weeks or meant to be under observation because supposedly it's on oxygen, which is somehow debatable. But he decides in his infinite wisdom because he's feeling good, right? He's feeling strong. He's feeling healthy. That he wants to go outside and meet some of the protesters or some of the, sorry, supporters that are outside gathered around the Walter Reed Hospital, which is, again, another bizarre thing to see, you know, that they're actually, they're, there's fanboys for politicians now, which is bizarre to say the least, but I think it's a natural consequence, right? When people hate one side so much, the natural reaction is to be, you know, I'm going to back this guy, right? It's natural. But this is just utterly bizarre, man. Utterly, utterly bizarre to see. He's driving in a fully armored car, saying hi to the people that came out to, I guess, give him some good wishes while he's holed up in the house. So bizarre. There he is in the motorcade, waving by with the window drawn off a little bit. And that's him there. There's Trump Peter waving. What a bizarre world, isn't it, that we're living in right now? And again, think about it. It's less about even if, you, if not you believe if it's real or not. It's more about sending a message, right? That we're all in this together. Nah, I'm not. I'm doing it my own way. And this is maybe explained away a little bit via this um, article from NPR where Mary Trump basically says the f the family sees illness as unforgivable weakness, which kind of explains how he's kind of dealing with it. This is from NPR. It says the following. It says the attitude about illness is looming larger over the president's coronavirus treatment. White House physician Sean Connolly said on Sunday that he didn't initially disclose that the president was given oxygen on Friday, despite multiple questions about it from reports because he was trying to reflect the upbeat attitude of the president. <laughs> That's insane, man. That's insane. The White House position is lying to the American public about whether or not Trump got oxygen. Why? To save face. Like, who cares if he got oxygen? He's an older dude, isn't he? He's just going to get it. Oh, this is so weird. So, Trump's estranged niece, Mary Trump, said members of the Trump family have um, viewed illness as a display of unforgivable weakness. Mary Trump, who is suing the family for money and recently wrote Too Much and Never Enough, How My Family Created the World's Most Dangerous Man, told NPR's Michael Martin that illness was seen as unacceptable by Donald Trump and his father, um, Fred Trump. She said, which sounds incredibly cruel, but it happens to be true. That's why the U.S., uh, it, the US is in the middle of a horrible place we're in because we cannot admit to the weakness of being ill or our other people being ill, Mary Trump says. Um, there have been more than 7 million cases of coronavirus in the US and more than 200 people have died. So that kind of explains why he decided to go out in his motorcade and, you know, wave to supporters outside. But again, it's such a bizarre way to do it. I don't think any other leader in, world, in the world, even, even someone like a Putin, would have done it this way. Um, it'd be interesting to see what happens with the elections, though, going forward. Um, whether or not this will hamper his chances of getting re-elected or not, I'm not too sure. I'm not really sold on it. I think everyone's kind of talking up Joe Biden as a viable candidate, but I think the people that actually are going to go out and vote are going to secretly go out and vote for Trump anyway. I, I, have a, I definitely think that. I think when from from looking at history, whenever there's been, whenever a country's going through some sort of tom 
tumultuous time, they very rarely decide to change leadership. Usually everyone just thinks, you know what, we're dealing what we're dealing with at the moment. The last thing we need is a change of leadership, change of administration, um, and you know, a tearing up of the rule book just to kind of appease ourselves because we've got somebody that's annoying. I think if you if you can get through four years of Trump, you can get through another four years. Just grit your bed, just grit your teeth and sort of kind of get through it for the most part. I don't think, you know, because if you think about it, especially from the outside looking in, he, the ba- the worst thing about him is just what he says less so about what he actually does, right? I think there are people in his administration, the people within the Republican Party who are far more dangerous, right? You look at people like, um, what's his name? Moscow Mitch, um, and the stuff that he's allegedly done, right? And you think to yourself, God, if ever there's somebody that actually needs to be challenged, um, it'll be someone like himself, right? Like a Mitch McConnell. But you look at stuff, the stuff that Trump has actually done, it's actually rolled people. It's mostly the stuff that he actually says out aloud, you know? It's not really becoming of a prime minister. Sorry, it's not really becoming of a president. So if you can maybe grit your, grit, your, grit your teeth and bear it for another four years and then get an actual proper candidate people can believe in or kind of back, then that would probably be the best way to go about things. But I don't know. It doesn't seem like people in America have that kind of level of patience. They're probably at the end of their tether. You know, people are protesting in the street. People are LARPing and doing all these weird sort of like cosplay sort of fights in the middle of Portland and stuff. So if anything, this is probably the time that they're going to need to make some level of change because they just can't handle it anymore. But yeah, what a weird way to deal with things, right? What a weird way to deal with COVID in public too, especially when you want to, I guess it's not really, it doesn't really vie away from his brand, but if you want to implore the nation to sort of take the virus seriously, um, to not take unnecessary risk, you know, going out in your motorcade to say hi to people, especially if you think about the idea that it's a bulletproof car, right? It's probably the breeding ground for a an airborne virus to spread, right? Because it's hermetically sealed, I'd imagine, right? It has to be sealed in a way that would prevent you from getting shot at or for, you know, in any way, shape or form. So that's probably a perfect breeding ground for COVID to spread. I'd imagine they're probably making all the necessary precautions. They're testing everybody every day as they do in America. I don't know what they're doing, but... Yeah, what a bizarre, what a bizarre, bizarre world we're living in, man. Trump gets COVID and the way he deals with it is taking, is doing a bloody photo shoot. Like, it's just utterly, utterly bizarre. Really, really is. Like, just, just like, I, I don't see what anyone's meant to get from that. Like, do you buy any of this? Like, is this, does this make any sense to you? Does it fill you with confidence? Probably not, in it. But again, maybe in his side of things as well, he couldn't stay quiet. He knows if he would have stayed quiet and just received treatment, they were going to put so much mud on his name. They're going to disparage him, make up rumors. So he had to kind of come out, show a, show a kind of, uh, you know, put a strong face on it and hope that that's enough to sort of see him through to the next elections. But what a bizarre state of affairs. What a bizarre state of affairs. Next on the list, what else do we have here? Oh, brutal news for Paris. Paris is supposedly going to shut all the bars and raise the alert to maximum. Now, this is mostly based off the, um, made me think of this because of, of course, of the possession parties and what they've been doing over there in Paris. You know, these open air techno parties that they've been putting on for the best part of what, a month it feels like. Every other weekend, they'd, they'd kind of host these amazing techno parties in the middle of nowhere, somewhere outside in the rural bits of um, Paris, usually booking some really big DJs. I think the last big one to play was Amelie Lenz, but usually some great big acts come there and play. Hector Oaks played a few times, but they try and get a few of their residents. And it looks like a fun time. It looks flipping fantastic. But if you're keeping attention and you're kind of keeping your eye on the numbers and the news, it didn't necessarily seem like the best thing to do, right? Especially considering the amount of cases with young people, it didn't necessarily seem like they were putting their best foot forward or doing the best, you know, to their nation. And this is kind of maybe proof of the fact, right? This is from BBC. It says, um, Paris will shut all bars completely from Tuesday after the French government raised the coronavirus alert to maximum following a period of high infection rates. Bar gyms, swimming pools will be closed for two weeks in a bid to curb the spread of the virus, the city police chief said. But restaurants will remain open if strict hygiene rules are in place. On Sunday, France reported 12,564 cases of COVID-19. So, if you're a possession party person, do you take any responsibility for this? Do you think it's any of your fault if you put together an illegal rave or you put together a quote-unquote legal rave because it's open air but you packed it full of people? Would you feel any kind of guilt towards it? I, I guess you would. I think I would if I even went to a party like that and I'm de- I'm gagging to go to a rave. Even if I went, I'd be sort of feeling a bit guilty about it. 
like you know how many people have, have kind of put in to put it into harm's way and of course as as we've kind of always assumed um trying to take the you know the momentary joy that you would get from putting on a rave now is eventually going to lead to much more delays further down the line when things are starting to open up um it's a really really uh disappointing state of affairs really especially considering how um well paris were dealing with it especially towards the beginning of the lockdown though i remember those stories about restaurants thriving opening up the streets making the streets no parking no sorry no cars allowed on certain streets to allow restaurants to sort of spread their tables out on the street and stuff like and already you know paris is already a cosmopolitan city they do the kind of you know dining outdoors thing better than anybody maybe only second to places in spain but they were really thriving under that new model and then suddenly bang the rug gets pulled underneath your feet and you're back to square one so yeah uh, bad news if you're located anywhere in paris i guess in that regard moving on ba, 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 ba. what else do we have here not that one uh, da, 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 da. yeah let's just go on this one actually so this is from bbc regarding one of our mps from the house of commons um margaret Fer ferrier ferrier um has uh, unfortunately got herself in a bit of hot bother and again further illustrates the whole one rule for them one rule for us situation that we have here in the uk so it says here the house of Commons speaker has said he is very angry at the reckless behavior of an mp who traveled from glasgow to london with covid19 symptoms then returned <laughs> home after testing positive you couldn't make this up so lindsay hall said he would he could not believe that margaret ferrier had put other people's health at risk and he said he had she had not initially given a sh uh, straight story to the authorities miss ferrier has been suspended by the smp and faces calls to quit as mp has imagine facing calls to quit you should quit yourself dup mp jim shannon who was seated at the same social distancing dining table as ferrier um, as the MP so said on Monday evening, is self isolating but received a negative test result on Thursday afternoon. An assistant sergeant at arms was close to Ferrier when she spoke in the Commons on Monday but has not been advised to self isolate. Miss Ferrier has apologised and said that she deeply regretted her actions. And I don't know, like, again, the headline here says, Will she remain as MP? It's just a shocking state of affairs, and again, it further illustrates just how badly this um government has dealt with covid and again it's not to say labor would done a better job because that's not necessarily true but just in terms of optics right it's less it's less about this is more again a case of optics similar with a mask thing no one is telling these people to be perfect right if mistakes happen sometimes you make an error you want to rewrite it you tell a white line and suddenly you're you're spiraling yourself and you're in this situation that you never would imagine prior and if you just told the truth everyone would have been okay but i understand a lot's on the a lot's on the line a lot's at stake you don't want to necessarily put yourself in any unnecessary situations but you would imagine if you're an mp and you get caught out in this way especially post dominic cummings you just have to have to have to step down yourself just in order to kind of you know um just to kind of instill some faith in the government still that there obviously are some checks and balances quote unquote or that they do hold themselves up to the same standard that they're trying to ask the public to hold themselves up to it's just a really really shocking state of affairs and again like i said i have sympathy for the woman mistakes happen sometimes you again you, you tell a white light to get yourself out of another one and suddenly you, you're in a situation that you never knew you envisioned but if you're an mp you owe it to your constituents you owe it to the public to set a good example and if you can't set a good example you leave your post it shouldn't be more difficult than that so for her to be still be in a position only be suspended pending an internal investigation whatever else nonsense that's going on and for her not to lose her seat it's just shocking 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 and here's a statement here on twitter says the following i apologize unreservedly for breaching covid19 restrictions by traveling this week when i couldn't have when i shouldn't have sorry there are no excuses for my actions this is what makes it the worst right when she details it, she lays it out in plain in black and white on Saturday afternoon, after experiencing mild symptoms, I requested a COVID-19 test, which I took that day. Feeling much better, she self-diagnosed herself and then, you know, was uh, and decided that she was going to go out. Uh, it's just, again, feeling much better. I then travelled to London by train on Monday to attend a parliament as planned. This was wrong 
and I was very sorry for his mistake. On Monday evening, I received a positive test result for the COVID-19 and I traveled home by train again on Tuesday morning without seeking advice. This was also wrong and I'm sorry. I have been self-isolating at home ever since. Which is, again illustrates exactly what happened with Dominic Cummings. Because they weren't because they necessarily didn't want to isolate somewhere that wasn't home or somewhere that wasn't comfortable, they traveled um, at the risk of contaminating more other other people along the way just so they could, they could be nice and comfortable. These people, man. These people are just... I have a used test and protect and I have notified the House of Commons authorities who have spoken with the Public Health England and I've also notified the police of my actions. Despite feeling well, I should have self-isolated while waiting for my test results well duh and i deeply regret my actions i take full responsibility and i would urge anyone not to make the same mistakes that i have and to do all they can to help limit the spread of covid19 it's just like you don't you couldn't write the script you really couldn't write the script it's just utterly bizarre one of the most bizarre things i've seen in my entire life it's just insane insane um it continues here oh that's it yeah continue it, it, uh, I, I don't know I don't know, man. Like, like I said, I think this whole COVID thing has really taught me one thing that's just like, you know, read, digest the information that you can digest, make your own decisions about what you want to do with your own life and how you approach COVID. But you can't listen to what these guys are saying in Parliament. You just cannot, man. They're not really doing, they're not, they don't really have an idea what they're doing. It's just not the right way to go about things. Again, it's just a truly shocking state of affairs here. But hey, what can you do? Let's move on here. Da, 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 da. What else can we do here? Um, let's move on. What else can we see? Uh, what's next on here? List. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, let's end with this one. Actually, this is quite good. So the next collaboration in the McDonald's series is J Balvin, reggaeton superstar. Um, has got a collaboration with McDonald's. Um, this is from Hype Beast. Um, of course, you got a picture here. He's got a burg, a Big Mac, Sansa pickle with a McFlurry, an Oreo McFlurry, and a large portion of chips. Um, interesting approach in clones collaborations. I, I wonder if this is to do with COVID. I wonder if this is a response to COVID. I wonder if this is McDonald's's weird way of trying to get people back into McDonald's or ordering McDonald's in general, or as a brand awareness piece, because it's a very interesting approach. Because I wouldn't have ever seen McDonald's doing something like this prior to COVID. So I think it might have been a COVID initiative. Um, I like this idea that they sort of, you know, diversifying the artists they work with, not just necessarily limiting it to hip hop. They've obviously, you know, branched out to reggaeton. Who knows who they might pick up next? Probably some big pop star I'm imagining. And it seems like they're also lining up with artists who no matter how big they are, because, you know, I don't think every artist in the same train. I'm sure some have very, um, you know, uh, particular opinions when it comes to dealing with mcdonald's but i like that they're you actually using artists who actually eat the food right that's one of my common gripes i have with some of these influencer marketing campaigns or in general they'll just you know a brand will reach out to somebody who has a high follow account just because they want to somehow convert whatever followers they have into sales it's a really ridiculous way but i know i've worked in marketing i know how people think they somehow think if i line myself with this fo this influencer who has 50 million uh, followers i can somehow get to 50 million people that's not true and they also think that somehow they're going to convert 50 million people into sales which also isn't true but the best collaborations i've seen in my in my um experience working with brand doing brand partnerships doing influencer partnerships the best ones are the ones where they marry up where there's actually an interest and actually a common goal, a common affection, a common adoration between both parties where one person has used the brand unbeknownst to them, you know, in their regular everyday life and now the brands are actually reaching out to them. It seems more organic. It's more in tune with their brand. Um, their, their followers have seen it, then post it sometimes on their own social media feed. It makes complete sense. So when you line up with somebody like a Jay Balvin, who's uh, a proponent or somebody as a fan of the McDonald's chain itself, it kind of hits a bit different. The only thing I would like to have seen with this collaboration, I know they're probably going to do the same thing they did with Travis. They're probably going to do an activation in the store. They're probably going to do, um, you know, um, some merch that Travis did. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Would they do merch? I'm pretty sure they'll do the same thing that he did in terms of merch. But I would like to see a lot more a bit more of a custom look onto the actual food itself. I think maybe that was the way they kind of did it during covid that gives me indication because there's there is no custom packaging it's just the regular packaging you get with mcdonald's and i guess 
Um, they just advise the staff members um, that are working in the branches to make the necessary edits on the meals. You know, as soon as you say J Balvin, they know what it means. So J Balvin, Big Mac is sounds of pickles and stuff. That makes it completely easy. But it would be cool to have a bit more of a customizable uh, packaging, maybe just a box or the bag that you're using. That would be pretty cool. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So it says here, following, it's well known that J Balvin enjoys a good partnership considering that Reganto Superstars partnered with the likes of Takashi Murakami, Jordan Brand, and even Deepak Choker in recent months. Absolute beast. The singer's latest joint effort um, might be his biggest to date. However, as Balvin links up with McDonald's for the fast food chain's latest um, artist menu collaboration. You know what's also really interesting? This is going to test a lot of artists' morals. Some of these guys are like kind of espouse the idea of like being against factory farming, being vegan. No, vegan is not a thing because you're definitely not going to eat McDonald's if you're vegan. But just the people that have very strong opinions about fast food, they're definitely going to be tested when McDonald's comes with a bag and says, hey, do you want to do this brand deal or not? That's really going to test your resolve. Um, it says the following quote from Jay Balvin says, I've been a big fan of McDonald's since I was a kid. Balvin told Hypebeast from his home in Medellin. When I was a kid growing up in Colombia, we didn't have McDonald's until later. So when I visited the United States, it was always like the first thing we would go to is McDonald's and I'd get my usual Big Mac, Oreo McFlurry and a medium French fries with ketchup. I've always gotten the same thing since I was a kid. No pickles though. Looking to uphold the relevance um, of the Travis Scott high performing high profile menu, McDonald's recruited Balvin to give his personal spin on their signature serving. As Balvin mentioned, his menu includes a Big Mac sandwich free of pickles, medium sized fries and a serving of ketchup. Um, appropriately, each of these treats have realized um, with precious stones what each of an upscale vandal design necklace and balvin wardrobe okay a video interview okay cool um when mcdonald's called me to ask for the collaboration i immediately said yes it was a huge uh, part of my childhood and my day-to-day -day. mcdonald's is just part of my culture you know i grew up with it and i'm proud to be the first latino to have an exclusive menu it's really cool to represent a, a lot of firsts for my people like my jordan collab uh the super bowl show i mean even hispanic heritage month so the time is is right so Again, I think it's good for them for the McDonald's because it's again it's a low effort collaboration. It's just them essentially getting an artist to come in, edit a menu, edit a edit a set you know set item they already have on the menu, and then basically you know uh, run it out to the staff members and boom, Bob's your uncle, Granny's your aunt, and then I guess as well there's maybe is there maybe a monetary gain in order for if you have more people ordering set menus as opposed to ordering individual items because i know when i go there i usually order individual items i don't order set menus so maybe that's a, a monetary gain that way but again i would like uh, maybe this is obviously an opportunity for them to test this model to see if it's got any sort of traction and then further down the line they might be um inclined to do artist collaborations in terms of actually making or creating a bespoke burger right like a different patty different combinations uh and breads and shapes and shit and different sources that might be an avenue they might explore later on down the line this might be a little bit of a tester or a bit of a taster no pun intended but yeah cool to see um this says here it's going to arrive uh last from the 5th of november to the 5th of october so the 1st of november like the scott mill the savvy customers can snag a bargain when ordering the, through the mcdonald's app which uh will score them the oreo but for free oh wow okay awesome so they're obviously trying to push people to the um to the mcdonald's app uh for the, 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 the. so yeah definitely check that out if you're a fan of mcdonald's you're a fan of jay balvin Kai cannot be a fan of both, innit? They're both absolute legends. But yeah, that is an hour of the Agostino Zinger Show. Thanks so much again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. If it's your first time tuning into the show and you're watching via the YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're, of course you're tuning in via the podcast app, um, you're more than welcome to download the show and leave me a five-star review. That will really help to spread and get the awareness out there. And as per usual, I'll see you guys again in another episode of the show, maybe tomorrow. Take care. Peace. Bye.